All right, so this is an example I've been wanting to do for a long time, uh, calculation of escape velocity. Uh, so we haven't quite covered Newton's law of universal gravitation yet, but you are given this uh, formula in this particular exercise, so it's fine that you haven't been given, uh, we haven't covered Newton's law of universal gravitation yet. We'll just use this as an example of a variable force. So, um, what we are going to need as we uh, try to calculate escape velocity, we are going to need the amount of work done by the gravitational force. Uh, so we'll need to know work done by gravitational force. And we can tie that into the gravitational potential energy. The gravitational potential energy is um, the negative of the work done by the gravitational force, or the, that's rather that's the change in the gravitational potential energy. Uh, but uh, you know, here I'll just work with the, the work done by gravitational force. I think that's sufficient. So when we talk about work done by gravitational force, we need to have some kind of displacement in mind from what point A to what point B. So let me just sketch a little bit of picture so that I have a concrete image in mind. This is my Earth. And let's say we have some object that's uh, right on the surface of the Earth. Uh, one way to describe it would be it says some distance r, where r is the radius of the Earth from the center of Earth. And uh, this expression will work for any point that's outside the, uh, the I guess, the crust of the Earth. So on the surface of Earth or farther away. Um, and I'm imagining this object moving. Um, for now, let's keep it general. So we'll say it's going from A to some point B that's going to be at a different distance, Rb, R sub B. So for this uh, work done by gravitational force, what we need to say is, uh, so, so you start out with the uh, infinitesimal amount of work done. The infinitesimal amount of work done, meaning amount of work done going from one spot to another spot really close by. That's going to be equal to the force times the infinitesimal distance traveled. And uh, before, when we were talking about work done by variable force, the difficulty was that when you have a long interval, you don't know exactly what force to use because variable force means your force is changing. With this infinitesimal approach, the solution you get is that the, you can use exact value of the force at that exact point. The magic of calculus being as your interval goes to zero, this uh, expression that we are going, going to drive becomes exact, not an approximation at all. So from this, in order to get the, uh, the total amount of work done going from one point to another point, you have to integrate from point A to B. You have to integrate from point A to B. Then that'll give you the amount of work done going from A to B. So let's uh, plug in the actual expressions and work this out. It's a um, relatively easy integral. Um, <laughs> and you know, for a calculus-based physics class, we haven't done a lot of calculus. Uh, this is one of the few uh, explicitly calculus stuff that we do. So we are integrating from, let's uh, represent the point A, points A and B by their radii, radius A. So X being at radius A to radius B my force is going to be minus g times mass of the earth times mass of the object divided by x squared times dx. And let me make sure my um, signs like this make sense. So dx, as it increases, my displacement is going to be pointed radially outward. This is going to be my dx vector. And the, the gravitational force, it's a pulling force. It's a force that's directed this way. So when I have minus sign here, I think all the signs make sense. Because this is uh, what's supposed to be f dot uh, dx vector. 
This is expected to be negative based on these directions of vectors and expressed this way, I think they're going to be uh, negative. So that's good. Um, so that's my integrand. I need to integrate. Uh, let me move this out of the way so I have space to write down my mathematical expressions. All right, that's been moved out of the way. So let me um, first uh, factor out all the constants so that I'm not distracted by constant factors that don't affect the integral. So uh, minus g, mass of Earth is constant, even the mass of the object is constant. I think that's everything. x is a variable. That's my coordinate variable. So I have 1 over x squared being integrated with respect to x going from Ra to Rb. Oh, I think I know how to do this integral. It's a power integral, you know, x raised to power of minus 2. So the antiderivative for that, just uh, running it in my head, the antiderivative for this should be 1 over x. And um, when you think you have the antiderivative, the way to check it is uh, take the derivative. You know, take this expression, imagine taking the derivative. You know, derivatives are a little bit easier than integrals. Uh, you know, this is x raised to power of minus 1. Applying the power rule, the factor of minus 1 comes down. So the derivative will be minus, and then the, the power um, exponent is decreased by minus 1. So from minus 1, another minus 1 decrease. It's going to be minus 2. So it will be 1 over x squared. Oh, so I think I forgot a minus sign. So let me make sure I have the minus sign, uh, or when I write it down, I have make sure I have minus sign there. So doing this integral, what the expression should be is all these constant factors times the antiderivative minus 1 over x, which is going to be evaluated at x equals ra to rb, uh, upper and lower limits. And what those limits mean is I'm going to plug in those numbers one at a time. I'm going to plug in. Again, the constants of first. I'm going to plug in uh, Rb first. So it'll be minus 1 over Rb, minus, minus, or so plus, and then the lower limit, 1 over Ra. Um, so that would be the work done. I think that's uh, probably enough of an expression to try to answer the following question. Um, so it says, um, a says, following the same integral procedure, find the gravitational potential energy of a mass at a distance r from a mass m. Set the reference so that the gravitational potential energy goes to zero as x goes to infinity. This is a common reference point to, to use. I might, in a future lecture that you haven't yet seen, I might refer to um, this arrangement where uh, potential energy as r goes to infinity as being zero as the universal reference point. Universal like um, the stars are universal to anyone who's either on Earth or in the solar system. When, so when something's really, f really far away, that is something that everyone can refer to. Unlike, you know, like this is height on the desk, which only I have a good sense of uh, what that's like. So, um, so what that means is, let me write down this expression for the potential, gravitational potential energy, which is going to be minus uh, work done by gravity. And um, more accurately, it's the change in gravitational potential energy, that's that. And let me rewrite this change in gravitational potential energy using this universal reference. Uh, doing that, what it should look like is uh, you need to have a um, potential energy for uh, some point you end up at. I'm going to call that U of R. And you are subtracting your reference point potential energy, which should be energy at R goes to infinity. So this is my expression for change in gravitational potential energy. So for this, what I'm imagining is I'm imagining my point A is actually way out really far at R equals infinity. And my point B is somewhere at a finite distance that I can refer to with RB. So uh, let me um, just finish writing this down. So minus work done. I have this expression here. So minus G. Me times m 
So my RB, my final point will be lowercase r. That's the position where I'm trying to find the the um, trying to find the gravitational potential energy uh, plus, and this R A is gonna go to infinity. So the proper notation would be limit as R A goes to infinity one over R A. I'm kind of being longer than I need to be because this is really just gonna be zero. It doesn't have to be complicated. So let me just write this all out. Um, so I hope uh, I have the right number of negative signs. <laughs> um, so I see these two things canceling out. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess the uh, gravity does positive work. As something is falling towards the center of gravity from far away. Uh, so positive work, that's fine. But for the expression for the potential energy, I have this minus sign, which remains. And by convention, this is going to become zero. That's the universal reference point to convention. So I have this equal to all that. Let me write down the cleaned up version, which is going to be gravitational potential energy at some distance r um, outside the body that generates gravity is equal to minus and all that minus g times mass of the earth times mass of the thing divided by r. I think that looks right. Um, I guess the one thing to make sense of is should your gravitational potential energy be negative and I hope um, after some thinking through, you realize, arrive at the answer that yes, it should be negative. Uh, because, so if uh, infinitely far away, it's a zero. The, and as you imagine how that object should move, if it moves at all, it should move towards the object that's producing gravity. And I hope you know the principle that things tend to move from place of high potential energy to low potential energy. So moving from graph potential energy zero, the only place where it can go lower in potential energy is into negative values. And that is really what uh, this is showing, that any r other than infinity, your gravitational potential energy will be negative. So, so yeah, this is the, um, the, the expression for gravitational potential energy, which you will see derived again when we cover uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation. Now we are going to use this expression um, to answer this question, assuming conservation of mechanical energy. So we are now back to considering this scenario where I have Earth. And on this Earth, there are some objects here. And let's say it's just outside the atmosphere, so we don't have to worry about air drag. Um, how much kinetic energy must it have? So some kinetic energy it has so that it can escape the gravitational pull of mass m. Um, instead of mass m, I'm just going to say it's Earth. Um, so it's asking, uh, to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth, what it means is that this can go out to the distance that's going to be treated as infinite. So um, for it, if it has enough energy here, it can somehow reach this final state here where it's at infinite distance away. And um, for to find the minimum kinetic energy that it needs to have, let's consider a minimum scenario, which should be around this point. Its kinetic energy will be around zero. It has used up all its initial kinetic energy to reach really, really far away, and it barely has any kinetic energy left. So since we are assuming conservation of mechanical energy, we can use conservation law uh, strategy. So um, here, our conserved quantity is energy. It's kind of uh, built into the question. <laughs> so we say your uh, mechanical energy, total energy in one snapshot. I'm going to say this is my one snapshot, snapshot one, is equal to your total mechanical energy at a different snapshot that I'm going to call snapshot 2. And the beauty of conservation law strategy is you can simply set up that total energy in snapshot 1 is equal to total energy at snapshot 2. You don't need any in-between steps. You don't need to know what the force is doing in between as long as you have assurance that, um, that energy is conserved. So in snapshot one, I have kinetic energy one plus potential energy one 
In snapshot two, I could potentially have kinetic energy two plus potential energy two. So let's write out specific expressions for this. Uh, kinetic energy as snapshot one. Um, oh, uh, I guess I'll just leave that alone since that's going to be what I'm going to be solving for. And potential energy as snapshot one, I'm going to use the radius of Earth um, for the, the position, distance, etc and then use the expression that we just derived to write down the gravitational potential energy. It's going to be so Ke1 and then this expression minus constant g times mass of earth times mass of object um, yeah small mass m big mass m uh, divide by the radius of earth is equal to so it is a final point so let's say we our kinetic energy is going to be zero we are looking for the minimum uh, scenario where minimum possible uh, kinetic energy to be able to reach that position and uh, my potential energy oh i think that's also zero by the reference point i set you, you, so you know uh, your r is going to infinity and both when you plug this in here you get a zero uh, potential energy here and um, also just uh, uh, by the how we set the universal reference point this is going to be zero so that's pretty simple i think uh, then just uh, solving for this you just move this quantity over you get the minimum kinetic energy you must have had is this positive quantity g times mass of earth times the mass of the object divided by radius of earth okay i think that's the expression Let's look at the next question. The velocity associated with the above kinetic energy is called escape velocity. Let's call that V naught. Now calculate the escape velocity of an object near Earth. So we are given constant g, mass of Earth m, and I guess somehow we must not need this. Let's uh, see. So uh, we are going to write down an expression for minimum kinetic energy. That will be one half mass of the time object okay that's how it's going to cancel out times the escape velocity squared is equal to that same expression for gravitational or not gravitational potential energy same expression that relates to the gravitational potential energy uh, g times mass of earth times mass of object divided by radius of earth and mass of object doesn't matter like in many gravity related phenomena and I'm going to just do the final bit of algebra in my head, solving for v naught. That's going to be square root of 2 times g times me divided by re. Okay, do, uh, I think they want me to calculate, on, um, um, calculate the numerical value. So let me do that in Wolfram Alpha. Uh, I, I'm using Wolfram Alpha mainly for the reason that um, it's going to make my work easier. Because it'll just look up the constants. I don't have to enter these values that they've given me. I can just say, all right, I want um, square root of uh, 2 times gravitational constant times mass of Earth divided by radius of Earth. And after you enter, make sure it understood you correctly. Um, yeah, a, yeah, Earth equatorial radius. Yeah, looks good. So it's uh, 11, um, comma, so it's uh, 11, comma, 180 meter per second, or to make it a number that's kind of easy to remember, 11.2 kilometers per second. It's pretty high. Um, the cars, uh, automobiles, travel at something like I don't know, 30 meters per second. That took about 65 miles per hour. And um, and uh, airplanes, uh, if they're traveling at like near speed of sound, which many jet airplanes do, they'll be traveling at something like um, a three, 400 meters per second. So this is speed of airplanes times uh, 30. Uh, this 0.3 kilometers per second would be how fast uh, typical non-ultrasonic airplanes travel. Multiply the by about 30, 40, you get uh, escape velocity. So, 
so yeah, that, it's a, I really want you to get to that, get that number sense. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do this. And let's look at part D. Uh, for an astronomical object of Earth's size, how much mass should it have so that its k velocity of an object is around the sea? Speed of light. Yeah. Um, so this is a kind of classical radius of a black hole. And it happens to match what's called the Schwarzschild radius. So um, the, the uh, number that we will calculate if we ever do general relativity, there's something called, uh, I hope I'm spelling it right, Schwarzschild, it's uh, some German name, Schwarzschild radius. And um, that's going to be the number we'll calculate, which is the, um, so I'm going to take this expression and actually do something different. We'll say our instead of trying to solve for escape velocity, we'll say we have the escape velocity, that's the speed of light, and say that's equal to square root of two times g times some mass of an unknown thing, black hole. And we are still going to use the radius of Earth. So starting from that expression, if we are trying to solve for the mass of this black hole, then you know, do the algebra. I'm gonna do that in my head. Uh, make sure I didn't make any mistakes. And one check that I can do is I can put this into Wolfram Alpha with all the units and hope that I have unit of kilogram at the end. So let's give that a try. All right, so let's plug in the numbers and see. We're gonna get um, so speed of light squared. I don't know if I need the parenthesis. Let me just do it. Times uh, Earth radius divided by two times gravitational constant. Let's hope that's gonna be mass uh, in kilograms. Yeah. Why does it have so many? It might be keeping so many significant figures because the C. Um, but it's not defined with that many sig figs. It's defined with like a 10 significant figures, maybe. I mean, technically it has an infinite significant, significant figure with those 10 digits, but uh, <laughs> not what I recommend. And then, you know, now when you look at this number, you know, 4.3 times 10 to the 33 kilogram, it's frankly hard to get um, your mind around it. It's such a large number that most people don't have any um, um, kind of sense of intuition around. It's an astronomical number. So a good thing to do is compare that with another astronomical number. One that you, I might try at first would be like a mass of Earth. How much, uh, how many times more than mass of Earth should that be so that Earth is a black hole, not, you know, not Earth. Um, then we look at, okay, 7.19 times 10 to the 8 or almost too close to a billion times mass of Earth, <laughs> which I think is still so large that I don't have a good intuition for. Um, so if you're thinking of large mass, uh, the closest example we have is actually the sun. So we might think of, okay, how should this object compare with the sun, the nearest the star to Earth, um, to, uh, to act like a black hole if it's the size of Earth? And comparing that with the mass of sun, yeah, still 2016, uh, wait, 2160 times mass of the sun. So even if somehow you took the sun, shrunk it down to Earth's size, somehow it's not going to become a black hole. Uh, you need a star that is two, three times the mass of our sun that uh, that'll behave like a black hole when you shrink it down to the size of Earth. Um, it is, some of these astronomical things are really hard to <laughs> wrap your mind around, um, uh, which is uh, its own kind of fun, if uh, things like that is fun for you, um, or possibly not so fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is uh, um, something that you might see if you do um, special, uh, sorry, general relativity, um, where people talk about black holes. Um, but for any more more down to earth examples, this is a good number to know. You know, about ten kilometers per second is about escape velocity um, of. So, 
um, for any object that's leaving Earth and doesn't have a significant engine that can add thrust later, it needs to be leaving Earth at something like you know, 11, 12 kilometers per second to be able to actually escape Earth. Now, you know, in the solar system orbital mechanics, there might be other complications. Um, you know, it can do slingshot maneuver with other planets to get more velocity, that sort of stuff. Um, but ignoring all that, an object has to be leaving Earth at this speed to be able to get really far away from Earth and not have to fall back down to Earth.